Hey everyone, we're Journey to the West. I'm here with Jay and a special guest, Lisa. Yay! Hi! For our collaboration podcast. Um, we just wanted to say that we are so thankful because um, this idea came from April Mag. One of the things I love about this is that it's like a network for Asian women to come together, not just from the US, but from all over the world to empower each other because there's very little platforms that specifically focus on the voices of Asian women. And so we'd like to talk about a lot of things in April Magazine from beauty trends to also real life stuff like dealing with racism and a lot of intersectional stuff and feminism as well. And so what I really like about April Mag is it's a platform and they've especially helped me out a lot because like I've wanted to be a writer, but like I've gotten rejected plenty of times. And then they were the only ones who listened to me, who believed in me. And so I am really thankful for April Mag. How about you, Jay? Well, I'm a recent writer for April Mag. I just started writing this year, actually, and I'm really thankful that they were able to give me a platform to share my stories. They're one of the few publications out there that really focus on giving Asian women a voice. So if you've had trouble publishing your stories the way that you want them to be told elsewhere, I would definitely recommend April Mag. Yeah, so I guess I'm in the similar boat with you guys. I wanted a place where I can share my ideas, my thoughts, my opinions in a safe environment. And they're very accommodating. I mean, they have a whole range of topics that they address, issues, and it's a, it's a really nice community. Um, I really enjoy my time writing there. And I've been putting out articles just since late last year. And so this podcast will be basically a collaboration with April Mag writers like Lisa, Jay, and I. And we would also like to come together because there is something very important we need to address. So around the beginning of the new year, there was a very controversial incident that happened in Japan. When we first heard about this incident, it was mentioning a particular YouTuber who was really famous named Logan Paul. What happened was he went to the Aokigahara Forest. Please excuse my pronunciation. Let me know if I'm wrong. And so he went into that space and he found someone who had just passed away recently. And so he he was basically recording the con in the forest and it caused enough controversy where people were outraged. Jay, when did you first hear about it? Ooh, well, I had just gotten on Twitter and there was a storm of outrage about Logan Paul's behavior in Japan. So the video had already been taken down by that time, but I was able to see get the gist of what had actually happened, why people were upset, and his sorry, not sorry, apology letter that he had posted. Initial thoughts were, what a horrible thing for a person to do, one. Secondly, I have the feeling that he felt like he could get away with this because it was in Japan, specifically because it was in Asia. And due to stereotypes about Asian people, he felt like he could do whatever he wanted without consequence and that this was okay. It was very dehumanizing for the Japanese people. When did you hear about this, Lisa? Yep, so I heard about the incident pretty much as soon as it happened. And um, by the time it was already taken off from YouTube, but there were re-uploads from other channels. I guess to clarify, like I'm not a fan of Logan Paul and... That's just because I don't keep up with his online activities. I knew him first as a Vine creator before moving to YouTube, and I was actually really surprised by the size of his fan base. You know, maybe my views today would be kind of skewed because I don't follow his content, but you know, I have a basic understanding of Logan Paul as a role model to kids and teens, the kind of influencing power he has on social media, and his reputation is quite polarizing like amongst kids and adults. I personally heard about this incident also the day it happened, right after he removed the video. My first thoughts on it was how sensationalist and problematic it was because like a lot of people were outraged, but they went on Twitter to talk about it. And then we'll explain later about why I'm outraged about this. But overall, like I thought it was really rude to the Japanese 
because where I was, I was vacationing and there was a lot of Japanese people around and Japanese tourists and I thought it was demeaning to them. In fact, I remember someone I knew said that they asked a person from Japan if they already heard about this and where I was and they're like, yeah, let's not talk about it. Everyone knows. So it was already global and already in the news headlines by the time I was aware. And so afterwards, I believe a day or two later, Logan Paul released an apology video. This was right after, I think he had the backlash. It was the initial backlash. And then he released a video talking about his apologies and then how this is about not about him, but it's about making awareness of suicide and all that. What are your thoughts about that, Jay, on his apology video? Uh, sounds like a cop-out. Well, I can't really tell if he feels actual remorse for his actions, especially since his initial apology, which was a letter, referenced himself most of the time and did not at all speak about how he treated the victim, the victim's family, Japan in general. So I'm very skeptical as to whether he learned anything from this incident. He's a privileged white guy from America, cavorting around in Japan, treating it like his playground. I don't think that he's changed after this just because a lot of people were upset by what he did. And what were your thoughts, Lisa, on the apology video, if you've seen it or heard of it? When the news blew up, it was pretty much everywhere online. And like the backlash on YouTube was pretty incredible. And so before the apology video, I stopped keeping up with all of these reaction videos after the first day or two because they all reiterated the same general consensus that what had happened was unacceptable. You know, a lot of people speculated the sincerity of his apology. And, you know, under his company, it had to be done. That was a given. And, you know, I know he's also an actor, but, you know, I give him the benefit of the doubt. The person he really ought to apologize to had unfortunately passed. And, you know, I'm concerned about how this has shaken his fans because there's still so many who defend his actions. And, yeah, I'm not defending him, but I can understand the rationale and wanting to share this experience. I mean, understand that he's been producing a daily show of his life two to three years now, consecutively. The biggest disappointment, failure, was that there was no executive decision that was made to censor or omit the body during editing, and you know, this turned out to be the cover image of the video that trended for several hours. Seeing that that image was in the thumbnail definitely hammered home the point that this was intentional. And even at the end of the vlog, he, um, you know, he pleads for those affected with mental illness or with suicidal thoughts to seek help. You know, I, I really don't think he's a terrible person, but I just feel like this was a bad choice and, you know, it's had its consequences that he's, he's going through repercussions of right now. Me personally, I thought what he did came off as virtue signaling because he apologized, but the thing was, there were warnings that he shouldn't have uploaded it. I mean, maybe he could have edited it out. He didn't have to click the button, but it came up as, I can't speculate whether he's sincere or not. I don't know that for sure, but what I cannot condone or what I'm not okay with is him not being held accountable. He went against Japanese law. He should have turned off the camera as soon as he saw the body. He didn't. That's my own personal thoughts, but enough about him. Let's get to the next, what we want to talk about, which is the significance of the forest. I'll just tell you about how I really got there. Um, I visited Aokigahara just two months before this happening, and it was a pretty spontaneous trip. You actually end up in Kawaguchiko, uh, which is a town that is at the foot of Mount Fuji. You know, it's famous for five lakes. It offers really lovely views to the mountain. Now, there's a sightseeing bus that takes you around to villages, to art museums. Um, there's a ice and wind caves, which uh, were formed when the hardening of lava that came from Mount Fuji when it erupted thousands of years ago. Now, you can find Aokigahara on Google Maps. There's no entrance or signage whatsoever. And it's just about a 15-minute walk down from the highway from the ice caves. I realized I found a trail through the forest. As for the significance of the forest, I, you know, vaguely knew about it <laughs> just from vlogs, from articles, documentaries. I was interested, you know, there was a small piece of bit of fascination about it, but, you know, I wasn't 
going to... I wasn't going out of my way to find this place, let's just say. I mean, there's no visual indicator that, you know, this is Aokigahara. I mean, you see massive trees. You soon figure out that this is the place where people vlog and make horror movies. So you have to kind of put one and one together. And, you know, I think we've got to establish that Aokigahara does not literally translate into suicide forest. This is a name that Westerners kind of invented, but the Japanese people will call it Aokigahara. You know, they realize that it's uh, it's a spooky place. You know, people talk of spirits or uh, what they call yurei, and they're like ghosts, right? They're in anime, they're in art, they're in literature. You know, Japanese people don't really talk about the suicide aspect, but, you know, just out of respect and privacy, they just keep it to themselves in case it deeply affects other people. So should we have a very different perspective on the Aokigahara forest itself? Like, can we appreciate its beauty? What are your thoughts on that, Lisa? People need to know that Aokigahara is not a gravesite. All right, it's, it's actually quite lush. It's green. There are miles of never-ending trees amongst mountains that surround Mount Fuji. You know, it really is quite a beautiful place. And um, these trees are so tall that the sky kind of disappears when you look up. And it feels like you're kind of swallowed up by nature. I think one of the scariest parts is how silent the forest can be. So once you walk far enough from the highway, away from all the cars and all the vehicles, it kind of you kind of get drowned out by all these bird calls and cicadas, and it gets really creepy. I went backpacking on my own, and oh, wow, I don't really recommend going by yourself. But I didn't really have a choice. And I say this because if, you know, anything were to happen to me and I had to call for help, I realistically don't think anyone would be able to hear me or to find me. I mean, Japan is a very safe country, but this was a place where I felt really vulnerable. I wasn't there to do a Logan Paul and find ghosts. But, you know, I've actually heard that school students would come to the forest on school trips just because of its wildlife and how beautiful it is. And it's kind of sad that this is all marred by all this controversy and people's obsession with death. I, I recommend it as a place to get out of the city, as a place for healing, as a place to just enjoy recreationally. But if you're there to focus on, you know, the horror aspects of this forest, then, you know, I, I don't really know what to say to that. It's a place where we should respect. Respect, I think, is the most important thing when you're going there. I agree. Absolutely agree. Just for verification for our audience, you're living in Japan right now, right, Lisa? Or Yes, it's pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad Lisa, for example, can offer a different perspective on the forest. Way different from like what we see in Western media. And I think what we need to get on here is that there is a greater problem with the commodification in a way, or like, this idea that media thinks Asia is someplace that's not only foreign, but it's an opportunity to engage in certain behaviors that you wouldn't engage in maybe at home. Jay, what are your thoughts? Didn't you write a recent article on what people like Logan Paul can do in, like, in Asia? There are a lot of content creators who specifically go to Asia and objectify it. They don't appreciate the people living there. They don't really have an understanding of the culture or care to. They don't act respectfully. And they're really just there for personal gain, which is unfortunate, but it's also not unusual. I mean, I could get into the history of colonialism and Orientalism, but I think that might be a little too long for this podcast. I will reference my article and talk about how other YouTubers, for instance, Dan and Rue, who recently filmed a video of them pretending to kidnap a child. I get a similar vibe from the videos that I did from Logan Paul's in that they're just treating Japan like a playground and they don't really care for the local customs or how the people there feel, which is unfortunate. And they're just using it to promote their brand. It's really dehumanizing in a way. I understand that it's their job, but don't don't treat people like that, please. And like not only that, but like YouTube, the way YouTube's built up. How does YouTube, like the way it's built up, allow for this to happen? Jay, what are your thoughts? I mean, I would say it's not necessarily just YouTube, but social media in general, this culture of likes, 
and and clicks and how much post engagement can I get on this video or whatever. It's veered from placing an emphasis on quality content to just anything that will get views. So they want to go for the more outrageous, the more sensationalized, the more edgy content, because that's what will get them more views, which in turn lead to more money and ad revenue. And it's unfortunate because the platform has the potential to do so much. And I feel like this is holding it back. And what I really notice is that despite the massive unpopular opinion and people voicing their discontent on videos like these, like for example, Logan's channel has not been taken down. While if other maybe smaller channels, even smaller than um, Rue or Logan did any of these things, maybe they might have taken, getting taken down. I mean, I wouldn't expect them to. YouTube has doled out some kind of punishment for Logan Paul in that they've basically not allowed him to be a part of their uh, specially promoted circle as some, one of the top creators on the platform. So he's maybe earning half of what he normally does. And they also put a hold on all of his YouTube Red projects. So there's a door that was closed. We don't know if this is a temporary thing or a permanent thing, but he's still continuing to make money. He's just not ridiculously as prolific of an earner. I've only a few videos have talked about the anti-Asian racism that has been applied recently when it came to Logan Paul and many other channels. There was another video released on Twitter about how he was wearing that rice hat and just going all over Japan and ended up actually breaking Japanese laws in his stay in Japan. He was harassing people on the streets, breaking Game Boys. Does what Logan do exemplify anti-Asian racism or... Um, as I have mentioned before, what enables him to do these things is that he doesn't view... He looks down on Asian people or he thinks he can get away with it because Asians won't speak up about it or tell him off. But I also think that he's misinterpreting Japanese culture and the fact that people will give you a dirty look instead of or avoid you instead of actually like pushing you away. In his videos, uh, he was talking about how, you know, Japan is just like a cartoon. And in some ways, I felt like that's how he felt that he should act amongst Japanese people, just because you know, speak the same language, that there's this kind of leeway. He can just do whatever he wanted to do. And like really trying to act on these stereotypes, of course, it's it's really disrespectful. and. YouTube really needs to respond to if this was to happen again by a different YouTuber, like what future actions that they can take. How do you respond to this level of racism? Anybody in Japan told you about how they felt about what Logan Paul did? Like any racism attached to it, Lisa? Well, I have spoken to friends about it, but you know, I can't really speak on the behalf of Japanese people. I mean, what has happened has been recognized as terribly disrespectful and you know, actually, everyone seems to be quite tolerant. You know, they're able to go on with their daily lives. People aren't actively criticizing it to anywhere near the same extent as like Western media, what's happening online. And just because that is the case, it really doesn't make it acceptable by any means. I just think that it's important to emphasize that Japan is trying to make a conscious effort to shake off this ghost story narrative and um, the suicide history in Aokigahara. Because it's not a point of tourism anyway. So they've actually stopped releasing the body count per year. And they've removed a lot of the signage around the forest. What Logan Paul did was unwind all of this effort that was intended to present a softer side of the forest. Thank you for your thoughts. Honestly, personally, I think this is a reflection of anti-Asian racism because... He wouldn't. I haven't seen him behaved to the extent he has in the U.S. as he has in Japan. Like wearing the rice hat, breaking stuff, and others like Rue kidnapping children, just fooling around. I find this behavior unacceptable personally. And what I think we also need to talk about is how this whole spiel. He ended up gaining another three hundred thousand fans, according to an article on Business Insider. So it was a really interesting thing that happened. I guess he was intending for it to happen. I don't know for sure. His Logan fans have been very 
they've stood by him. And so I want to open up the floor and ask about um, Jay. What are your thoughts on this, on his fans and how they've responded? Well, it's really unfortunate that instead of losing subscribers, he actually gained them. And knowing that his fan base is like nine-year-olds, 12-year-olds, it's disconcerting to know that these kids know about this but don't quite understand why it was unacceptable behavior. Are their parents aware that their kids are using this guy as a role model? It's it's just really sad to know that it seems like his brand isn't really suffering in the way that one would expect it to after doing something like this. Yeah, that's a really funny point that you brought up because did this event really tarnish Logan Paul's reputation? And I guess this also comes to a question as to whether someone like Logan Paul can really get a second chance to recover from this incident. I mean, there are definitely lessons to learn from, and you know, it really should be a wake-up call to fans um, about who these celebrities are, the people that they look up to. It's just really funny to see how this is rolled out and um, the kind of reactions that it's evoked. Yeah, I mean, I've seen what I assume is a nine-year-old fan defending him on Twitter. I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to have a Twitter account if you're nine, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts, Lisa? You know, it took a very long time for YouTube to respond and take action. And, you know, although you look at something like this and you, you realize that something wrong has happened, there's still a very, I don't know the economics of it, whether they still feel that there's hope to keep Logan Paul around just because you know, it takes a very long time to develop a fan base of, what was it, 15 million? To have that many people love you and to be dedicated to you, his sponsors and YouTube really need to step up their game. Like, Jay, what are your thoughts on YouTube's response? It seemed like they were dragging their feet almost intentionally because... A lot of people reported that video for its content prior to it being taken down, and YouTube didn't take it down. It was Logan who did it himself after the backlash. So, one, that's not a good look for YouTube. Secondly, one just has to assume that YouTube is focused on earning money, their company, and I understand that. But at one point, you have to weigh the consequences of Keeping somebody who clearly has done something terrible on your platform, do you, by extension, endorse this kind of behavior by allowing him to still have his channel with you? And so this brings up another greater question, which is that whether Logan's sponsors, collaborators, fans, or others who support him have any accountability that they should be held to or any standard, because... I remember that there were others like Melissa Marquez, Andy Altigue, and Brendan North who were also at Japan with him wearing rice hats. And then also, I think a couple of them went to the forest with him. What are your guys' thoughts, Jay? Do you think his collaborators and sponsors also have a role in this? Uh, well, the sponsors, similar to YouTube, should be aware of what happened and I hope try to distance themselves from him as well. His collaborators should also be held accountable for what they did. I mean, they're complicit in what was happening. They were also wearing kimonos and throwing stuff at people. They were also doing incredibly disrespectful things at shrines. At no point did any of them say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. It did not occur to them either, and a lot of them were also brushing off what happened in Japan, rather than feeling sorry or remorseful for anything. I haven't seen much of Logan Paul's other videos. Actually, I didn't really want to watch the videos that he posted while he was in Japan. As to his companions or friends, yeah, I'm not sure what the appropriate response to take would be. I mean, who who really instigated all of this? You know, who, who took charge and leadership? brought everyone there and made the decision to camp out, to keep filming. And, you know, all of this rolls up into you know, one massive problem. And it's really hard to, to really pinpoint the appropriate actions that should be taken. I'm not trying to say that any of these people who sponsor him or like 
collaborate with him or his fans. I'm not trying to blame it solely on them. I mean, I know we're trying to live our lives, but I think at the same time, there's got to be the sense of consciousness on what we're doing. Because personally, I think it's how you live by life. Like each action has a consequence. So I'm not saying punishes, punishes fans, punishes like collaborators. But <laughs> I think we need to let them know. They need to be made clear that what they did was unacceptable. Spread awareness. Let them know. You can spread awareness, but how do you make sure that they're not riding on this fame? Good point. Because in a way, I do feel like the outrage that spawned from this incident is what in part granted Logan Paul 300,000 extra subscribers. It's like free publicity. Yeah, as YouTubers, you're not immune to the lore. A lot of YouTubers who travel and vlog, you know, you do it in a positive light, okay? You, there's a tone that you put to it. You're, you're representing a country and, you know, you do so respectfully. You show its positives. You, you do so as a tourist, as a guest, I think there needs to be sensitivity to the way that you carry this out. I agree with Lisa's point. I am about to have an article coming out called To the I Don't Cares, and it talks about the sense that there is this apathy in regards to what happens maybe in Asia or Japan. I'm not speaking, I don't know for sure for all of Asia, but it's this sense that I think a greater problem is the apathy until something is at stake. And so I think one thing we need to remember when it comes to What's, what happens now is that since we live in a globalized world, I think there's this responsibility where we have to show respect when we go abroad. So what I want to do is pull out our final thoughts. What do we think we can learn from this? Starting with you, Jay. Be a decent person, whether, you, whether you're a content <laughs> creator or just, you know, an average Joe. Understand that you need to be respectful of other people and other cultures, especially when you're a guest in a foreign nation. Don't be exploitative. And if you're a viewer, don't support people who are being exploitative. Well, one, call people out on their their behavior. And two, throw your support to people who are actually working to do positive things, make a positive impact. Divest from people like Paul. Just in closing, I, I want to remind everyone that there were two pretty big movies that came out recently based on Alkigahara. The first is called The Forest, which has Game of Thrones' Natalie Dormer in it. Uh, the other one is called Sea of Trees, and that's with Matthew McConaughey. And these came out just like within the last two years. Both are horror movies. Both of these movies have white leads with Japanese supporting cast members. Now, both of these movies talk about suicide. And the point that I want to make is that Aokigahara is becoming frighteningly mainstream, and I'm afraid that it's for the wrong reasons. If you do choose to go to Yamanashi and visit the forest, then sure, I mean, by all means, enjoy it. Just remember to marvel at its beauty and look at things a little bit more holistically, besides the horror and besides the ghosts. Because there's really no place quite like it. We need to accept that with a globalized world, people can become more aware of what you're doing. And this brings to opportunity the commodification of like Asian culture, which is basically like reducing it to for your entertainment and only a one-time click. And also there's laced with anti-Asian racism. I think we need to acknowledge that a lot of... Rarely have I seen people delve into that angle but I think we need to address it, which is what we were doing in the podcast earlier, which is that there's a sense of disrespect. All I ask is that what we can do, what, one way you can make a difference is to show respect wherever you go. See people as like human. We all have feelings. We all have thoughts. We just want to be treated nice, human, with respect. We are all human beings. Well, everyone, thanks for listening in. And thanks, Lisa, for joining us. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And thanks, April Magazine. Shout out to April because they helped make this possible. And so if you would like to continue to listen to us, please subscribe to April Magazine. You could go on Facebook or Twitter and follow them. And then you could also read me and Jay's articles. Um, Jay already has her article released, but mine's coming up is called To The I Don't Cares. Hopefully it will be released by next week. Yeah, it might be out by the time that this podcast is out. We'll see.
since we're pre-recording this. FYI. True. But don't forget to subscribe to JTTW, Journey to the West podcast, and April Magazine. Thanks for listening. And thank you, everyone, here. Bye. Comment, subscribe. Bye. Bye.